Uh, did you need the handout? No. You are fine. A lot of times that'll work. I don't have my remote handy, so... That's all right. I'll get the steps in. Uh, I'll get steps in. It'll be good for me. Okay. Does my phone work? Uh, the clip, yeah. Okay. Hope there's enough batteries in it to uh, last me the... <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> I'm a little underprepared here. It's all right. I forgot to give Vince a hard time because my, uh, after the last week, after the first service, I traded microphones with him because I like his microphone better. But then the batteries died, and so I have to give him a hard time about us trying to sabotage my sermon. So is that going to be your home base there? That right here. If you could get it to so it sees the whiteboard. Yeah, you got the whiteboard on there. Morning. So on a totally different subject. Yeah. Tuesday afternoon. Also, because people want to sit in and play with us sometimes for fun. Two weeks from yesterday, we're going to meet on a Saturday and run through a bunch of Chicago turns. We got our, our guy. Got I'll be out of town Saturday. Okay. But I'd ask <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Just because, you know, Chicago's. Oh, yeah. Always. There's some fun stuff in there. Oh, man, yeah. So, but our regular bone player wasn't available. I said, well, I'm going to ask Cody wants to sit in on a Tuesday sometime. Any Tuesday afternoon, except this coming one, we're not rehearsing. But after that because we're going to try to do a concert uh -huh. in early December. Mm, okay. But just to sit in for fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the the Tuesdays aren't great for me, but oh, okay. it's they're, they're better than Mondays. One to three is our time. Okay. You know, so just keep it back of your head. If we were to work out one time. Mm -hmm. Of course, at Art Studio, it's right off of 270, just east yeah, of 270. Yeah, sideways. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's where we're at. Did you tell Trudy? If it, if it works out anytime, just let me know or shoot me an email or text or something. And my class is canceled or something, which happens on occasion. Oh, okay. that's fair. Yeah, I'll just let them know. But two weeks, you're going to be out of town. Two weeks, I'll be out of town. Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. But another time, maybe. Another we're time. rehearse about once a month just to play the charts for fun. Yeah. And so if you want to sit in, that would be fun. This pertains I would. I mean, it's a long name. I mean, think about going by Balthazar. I mean, that's that's a mouthful. I'm here. I'm here for the Good morning. Oh, that works very well. Good morning. Good morning. I feel like I'm doing the children's sermon. Good morning. So today we are continuing reading through the book of Daniel. We're on chapter three this week, which my subtitle is Fire and Fear. Hope, hope that gets you excited for chapter three, which is probably the most famous date, the most famous chapter in the book of Daniel, aside from maybe the lion's den, which comes a little bit later. But this is the story of the fiery furnace, which, I mean, there's a VeggieTales about it, so it's, it's, it's fairly well known. I grew up watching that VeggieTales. I, I guess many of you probably did not, but I grew up watching that VeggieTales. It, it's a good VeggieTales. Let us begin, before we do anything else, uh, with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, you led the three men to stand firm in the faith, to respect their leaders, but also to respect you and what you would call them to do. And you showed them the way that they should go. Lord, you also found Nebuchadnezzar in his sin and revealed yourself to him <laughs> that he may be turned to faith. In the same way, when we are led into sin, turn our hearts to faith in you. These things we ask in your name, O Lord. Amen. All right, so I think it's good to start every week 
with a quick review of what we've been talking about so far. So, can anybody tell me when in Israel, the timeline of Israel's history, I'm not looking for a year, although if you can give me a year, I'll be very impressed. Um, but I, I, give me, when does this happen? Anyone, the book of Daniel, in terms of Israel's chronology. <coughs> Was that? Who said exile? Yes, exile. That is correct. This happens during the Babylonian exile. Um, when Israel, uh, well, okay. So the nation of Israel, which David ruled over, splits into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which we call Israel, gets pretty much <laughs> completely wiped out. The southern kingdom, which we call Judah, is the one that sticks around. Judah is taken into exile by the Babylonians into Babylon. And that is where... <laughs> I think I'm not supposed to turn around or something. I don't remember how this microphone works. <laughs> but clearly that, that didn't work. I, I won't do that again. <laughs> so, Book of Daniel happens during this exile when God's people are in a foreign land under foreign control. And that's important that that plays into everything else that we're going to see today. Okay. Who? Who? Oh. It's Daniel. It's Daniel, yeah. Okay, good, good, good job. Yeah, you got, you got the hard one. Okay, can anybody summarize for me what happens in chapter one of the book of Daniel? What we talked about a couple of weeks ago that I went through. Anyone remember? Chapter. The rest were taken away. Yes. And bodies of the king. And uh, he wanted to make them like him. But they didn't want to eat food. That's what I remember. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so th that was the great like first half. So the, the young and the best are taken off into Babylon. Um, they're, they're bred up in, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar wants them to grow up to be good servants of him. And so he gives them the best food he has. And they don't want to eat it. And who remembers what comes after that? Daniel goes vegan, yes. So Daniel doesn't want to eat the food. He, he, he refuses to eat this food. It's unclean. It goes against his religion. And so he, he doesn't. And he makes all these sort of you know, legal moves. He appeals to his authorities. He's very respectful. And in doing so, he not only gets away with not eating the food that he's been told to eat, but he also wins the respect of everybody in Daniel's court. And God blesses him and his peers, and they become the smartest in the kingdom. Kingdom. Great job, guys. Chapter 2. Vince talked about this last week. What happens? The king is a dream. The statue with the different parts, no and there's a statue with different parts, and the statue is destroyed with a big stone. And what does that mean? Babylon is going to fall. But before that, he tries to kill all of his advisors. Okay, yes, he does threaten to, to kill all of them. I was going more like Babylon. So Babylon's the head of gold. So in the dream, Daniel says, you are the head of gold. Your kingdom is strong and powerful. And after you, other kingdoms will come that will not be as powerful. And then after that, they'll all be wiped out and the kingdom of God will be established, which is a reference to the coming of Christ. Chapter 2. With those things in mind now, we begin the next chapter, Chapter 3. And what I want to do is I want to start by just going through the whole chapter. Reading it through so we can kind of get a context of... Grabbing my notes here. So we can get the context of what is going on here. Uh, get the big picture. And then we'll go back and look at some details. Um, so I want to start with chapter 3. Uh, and can I have a volunteer to read verses 1 and 2? King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and its breadth 60 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then, the king, then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the straps of Sertrax, the Perfex, and the governors, and the counselors, and the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providences under the dedication 
of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, satraps and prefects. They're uh, <coughs> satraps, satraps. Sa- the L? No. <laughs> okay. You got me scared there. I was like, oh my goodness, I wrong glasses. <laughs> Apparently, I've been told it's prefects because Harry Potter. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I'll talk about that list in a little bit. Um, but what I'm interested in here is what is this statue that Nebuchadnezzar makes of? Well, it has to be a cube if it's 90 feet tall and wide. It's, so, it's 60 cubits tall and 6 wide. I missed the or maybe, maybe long. It's unclear whether that's like front to back or side to side. So it's it's 10 high and one wide. So by the way, this is a very big statue. This is taller than this building. It, it, this is a sizable statue. Uh, in order to keep a statue like this sturdy, they probably would have built it near the city wall and had some sort of like beam connecting it, but we're just guessing. Daniel doesn't really tell any, us anything about the statue, and the statue never really shows up again. So this is all we get about it. What do you think the statue is a picture of? What, what, what's it a picture of in this picture that I've got here? This is a fun medieval design. What, 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 what did Daniel make a statue? Or Nebuchadnezzar, not Daniel. Daniel wouldn't have done this. He knows better. What did Nebuchadnezzar make a statue of? Himself. Yes. So, so there's two common interpretations of what the statue is. One is that the statue represents Nebuchadnezzar, and that this is a sign of who Nebuchadnezzar is. And by bowing down before the statue, you're worshiping Nebuchadnezzar in all his glory. The other theory is that the statue is just another pagan idol. This was something they loved to do. They made idols of all their gods, and making a big golden statue of God would be sort of par for the course for Nebuchadnezzar and the people around him. And so it's also possible that the statue is of Nebuchadnezzar's gods. Daniel doesn't tell us which one it is. What do you think that is? For him, it wouldn't matter. Okay, yeah. It's either God or it's not God. That that is a good way to put it. It doesn't matter whether it's Baal or Asherah or Molech. It doesn't matter. If it's not God, it's not God. Well said. And that comes into play later with how they respond to the statue. Um, there's also an interesting contrast here. And the statue that he had made, it contrasts with the stone in a dream from chapter 2, which no human hand had made. And it's very similar vocab between those two. And we are supposed to, I think, read chapter 2 and chapter 3 together. There's some connecting points between the two chapters. So bear that in mind, too. Um, can I have somebody read verses, ch- uh, chapter 3, verses 3 through 7 now? Three through seven. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials from the province gathered with the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music were to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped Thanks. If all the readings are like that, people are going to stop volunteering to read (laughs) all those lists. So what is going on with these lists? What is the purpose of these long lists that keep showing up in this chapter? Anyone want to get, what what do you think these lists are for? Yeah. Well, I would better go with the list on verse 2. You get all the governing authorities. Seven are listed. Seven is the perfect number. Mm. So you've got 
the perfection of power. That's a good point. Yeah. And the completeness of it. This isn't just like some of the governing official. This is all of them. Whenever you see seven, it means completeness. It means all. This is all of them. So whenever you see one of these long lists, you can read like the first two items, go, oh, it's a list, and then just go all of them, and then skip after that. Don't do that when you're reading. I, we won't read the, through the whole list. But when you're reading on your own, if you see this really long list, you don't have to worry about what each individual item means. Just go, oh, this Dale means all of them. This, this is a very common literary device. Um, the instruments are also interesting here. Um, because here we have uh, horns, which, I don't know, when I think of a horn, I think of a trombone, in personal bias. <laughs> um, pipe. A pipe, I guess like like maybe like a pipe of pan, that's a lyre. They they wouldn't have had lyres back then. A trigon? What's a trigon? A harp? I, I think of like a like a classical harp, you know, where you sit down, you have all these strings. I knew a harp player in college. I don't think that's what he's getting at here either. Bagpipe? Bagpipe? Which actually is one of the words that we're more sure about. It probably is something somewhat similar to a bagpipe. All these instruments, don't, don't get too excited about. The thing is, when we understand Hebrew words, the way that we understand it is by looking at all the times that word shows up and then trying to put together from context what it means. And we have a lot of documents from that time, and so most words, we have a pretty darn good sense of what it means, except instruments. Because in this passage and every other passage where trigon shows up, Pretty much any instrument would make sense. So we don't have a great sense of what these instruments are. So don't, don't worry too much about it. The important thing is that all the instruments, there's a whole pile of instruments here going on that Nebuchadnezzar is having played. So all the governing officials are coming, and when they hear all the instruments, then they bow down and worship. Yes. Okay. Can I have someone read verses 8 through 12 now? 8 through 12. Yeah, Brian. Therefore, at the time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews, they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, fight, lighter, cry about heart, a fight, and every kind of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And twelve, too. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Perfect. So some guys come forward and they uh, accuse Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo of not bowing down to this statue. They're, they're clearly mad at them for something. I'm guessing, personally, that these are the guys who had to eat vegetables for like six months because of Daniel. <laughs> um, it's also interesting here, again, Daniel doesn't think it's really important to tell us who these guys are, simply what they did. And this is something very consistent with what we've been seeing throughout the book of Daniel. And this is something that's actually true of the whole Bible. It, it, the economy of the writing the biblical authors are very interested in telling you what they want to tell you and not a whole lot else. And so sometimes they, they go, oh, it's not really important what the statue's of. Oh, it's not really important who these guys are. Because that's not important to the narrative. And, and the way that our minds think, we go, well, who are these guys? What was the statue? We're, we're asking all these questions. We want to know everything about the situation. Whereas the biblical authors oftentimes have a very set goal in mind, and if it doesn't help them make clear that goal, who cares? And so reading the Bible, we have to always be conscious of, if I'm asking a question and the Bible doesn't give me a good answer to it, maybe it doesn't think that question's a good question. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't ever ask those questions, but it means we should think about why we're asking those questions and why Daniel didn't think it was important to ask that question. Okay, we continue reading then. Uh, 13 through 18. 13 through 18. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, demanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God or worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of a horn, pipe, fire, cry on the heart, play, pipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, he is known to you, O king, that we will not serve your God or worship the golden image that you have set up. Perfect, thanks. So, uh, a couple of things I find interesting here. So, so the, these three guys, they're brought before Nebuchadnezzar. They say, we're not going to bow down. Nebuchadnezzar's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll give you another chance to, you know, change. And they're like, no, we don't need a second chance. This, this is what we're going to do. Um, and, and two things I find interesting. One is I love what they respond. They don't say, our God will save us. They don't say, oh, you know, because we're being faithful to our God, we'll be saved from all harm. They don't make that assumption. Rather, they say, even if we will come to harm, we're going to do what God calls us to do. They don't know that the whole fiery furnace thing is going to, I mean, they know there's going to be a fiery furnace involved, but they don't know yet that they're going to be delivered from it. And so when they say this, they're not going, oh, we know we'll be saved no matter what we do. That's, that's not how persecution works. They know that what's coming next is probably not going to be very fun, and yet they still stand up for their faith. They still say, hey, this is a clear command that God has given, and I'm not going to violate that. And they're very nice about it. They're, they're pretty friendly about it, you know? They're like, no, no, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't want you to waste your time testing us again. Here, here's, here's what the results of that test is going to be. Um, the other thing I find very interesting in this passage is, is if you look at... Um, uh, look at what Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 15. He says, you know, if you don't worship, you will be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? I think it's noteworthy here that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't say, who is the God who could deliver you out of my hands? See, Nebuchadnezzar, he believes in gods. I mean, if he didn't, he, you know, wouldn't be pagan. I mean, th this, is, this is sort of the assumption that he's making, that there are divine beings out there, and that these divine beings have real power in this world. He, he knows that there are gods who could deliver these three guys from his power. But what he doesn't think is that any god would which, for me, it makes me think that the statue is not of Nebuchadnezzar, but rather of Nebuchadnezzar's gods. And it's interesting, too, uh, in verse 14, uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that you set up? It seems to me like those two are going together. The issue is they are not worshiping Nebuchadnezzar's gods. And Nebuchadnezzar says, Hey, what kind of gods are going to save you now? I have the most powerful gods of all, and if those ones are condemning you, who will go against them? He doesn't deny that they could. He knows his gods could. But what he doesn't think is that any god would want to save them for their act of impiety, for their act of defying what he sees as the most, as the greatest power in this world. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, because that's something interesting that some people forget when they're reading the Old Testament is that all these folks who believed in golden idols and everything like that, they didn't disbelieve the God of the Jews. They just assumed he was another God. Exactly, and yes. Just as powerful as their idols. Exactly. Yeah. It's not that these other nations don't believe in Yahweh, but rather they go, oh, you know, he's, he's Israel's God, right? They don't recognize that Yahweh isn't just Israel's God, but the God who made the heavens and the earth, who rules over everything in this world and everything under this world and everything above this world. Um, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar is about to find out. Yeah. The other part is interesting to me is when he asks, who will deliver you out of hand? 
they didn't really fly it back. Well, you remember that shot that occurred to that green for you? That one. So there's, there's something we learned there. But yeah, that, there's an answer to, and I, I want to come back to that later. But but you're, you're going to spoil my next point, or my point in a couple points from here. You're you're way ahead, Brian. Okay, let us read. I, I want to get through this whole narrative and then come back and talk about some stuff. Uh, verses 19 through 23. Someone read that for me. 19 through 23. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face changed him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be seven times more than it was usually needed. He ordered some of the mighty men of the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their clothes, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the burning fire. Thank you. More lists. Seriously, couldn't we have just called these guys by nicknames? I, I don't know. I'm sure I, if my name was Shadrach, I would not go by Shadrach. It's a mouthful. But what I'm interested in here in this section is actually, very at the very beginning, it's something you brought up earlier, seven times as hot. Now, does that mean that they, you know, looked at the, the thermostat on the first, they went, okay, well it's, well, it's 90 degrees, and then it's 630. Okay, we'll get it. No. It means that they got it a complete amount of times as hot. This is about as hot as this furnace is. I mean, this is hotter than this furnace is ever supposed to get. They ignored the uh, manufacturer's instructions and avoided their warranty. What I find interesting is Daniel does tell us this. Daniel doesn't tell us what the statue is even of. He doesn't tell us those guys' names. But Daniel does tell us they got that furnace really, really hot. And I think this is actually intentional on Daniel's part because this shows us something that God does throughout the Bible. God likes to, when God likes to intervene and he does a miracle, he likes it to be, he likes things to be gratuitously bad before he steps in. That, that is God, when he's going to deliver someone, he wants them to know that they didn't get out by chance or, you know, good fortune, but that there was absolutely nothing that could have saved them aside from his intervention. Because if the furnace was the normal heat, I mean, oh, you know, well, you know, if it's like my oven, oh, actually our, our new oven's pretty good. But if it's like the oven I had in my old apartment, uh, or two apartments ago, well, you know, that oven doesn't get that hot. I guess you could probably get out of that alive, you know. Seven times as hot. I mean, the guys who brought him in die. This is a hot furnace. And God, he wants to make, make it very clear who it is that is intervening here. Any other times? Uh, g- give me some examples of other times that this sort of thing happens in, in the Bible. Yeah. Elijah and the prophet of Baal, when they're doing the altar off, and he's like, just so much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, that whole story is just a, a case study in how God does this, right? He lets them go first. He gives them as much time as they want. They, they you know, can do all the things they want. He's pouring water on a sacrifice and still God intervenes and God makes it clear. <laughs> oh, you know, it wasn't just really dry and, you know, the brush, you know, rubbed again, the friction. No, no, no. This was divine intervention. God wants to be very clear who's intervening here. When the Israelites were going to cross into the promised land, the Jordan wasn't in dry season, it was flood season. When you stop the waters and the water. Absolutely, yeah. Well said. I, I, yeah. <laughs> He didn't wait until it was just a trickle and, oh, well, you know, we got through. It was kind of dry anyway. I mean, those waters were going, and we know they were going, because after he delivers them through, God's like, okay, I'll I'll let go of the water, and it wipes away an army that's following behind them, Pharaoh's army. God is demonstrating again. He is the one who is doing these things. Well, give me one more. 
the great flood. He just didn't have enough water just to kill everybody off. He covered the whole earth. And there was nothing above it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that whole story, again, is God showing, hey, this isn't, you know, just a really bad rainy season. I mean, this is divine intervention because he warns Noah. Noah builds his ark, and he's the only one who survives. The, the whole earth is covered in water for like 40 days. I mean, you didn't need 40 days, God. He could have done it in a little less, but he wants to be absolutely clear who it is that is doing this thing. And it reminds me of um, George MacDonald, who is an English theologian. English? American? English or American? He's writing in English. How about that? And he's talking about prayer. And he says, why is it that God asks us to pray for our daily bread when God will give it anyway? If you're, if you're familiar with Luther's explanation of the small catechism, Luther says, God will certainly give us our daily bread, whether we ask for it or not. So why then do we pray? George MacDonald says, think about it this way. If a, if a young child runs away from home and then after a couple of hours starts to get hungry, it'll run back home to its mom and its mom will feed him. And it'll come back for the food. But that's not really why it had to come back. In the same way, God asks us to pray for our daily bread, for all the things that we need, not just so that we may receive those things, which are nice, but so that we may recognize to whom we belong and who is really in charge. And that's true of all these miracles, too. God wanted to send fire down from heaven. God wanted to, to do the flood miracle. God wanted to deliver his people. But even more so, he wanted his people to know who he was and whose they were. And so he wants to be unequivocal in his acts here. And that, I think, is what's happening here with this furnace, too. God wants it to be clear, not just that, you know, they survived, but that this is a God who is higher than any of Nebuchadnezzar's gods, a God who is worth worshiping, unlike that statue. Can I have someone read verses 24 through 27? This is, this is the country. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fire and furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not and any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Perfect. So they're in the furnace, and there's someone there with them who is, uh, as Nebuchadnezzar says, like a son of God, or a son of the gods. This, this is tricky. In, in Hebrew, when you talk about God, like, like God, God, you'll pluralize his name because or you'll pluralize the word God, and it's, it's like a plural of majesty. Think about like um, the, the royal we. You know, the, the queen will say, we think, and she's not talking about her and the other people, it's a plurality of greatness. She's saying, I am so great that I deserve to be called by a, a plural noun. In the same way, when you talk about uh, God with, with the word God, uh, Elohim, uh, the word is pluralized to show just how great God is. But that's kind of confusing then in a passage like this, where it's like, well, are they talking about God or is Nebuchadnezzar talking about gods. And I think actually Daniel might be uh, making it a little ambiguous intentionally, because maybe Nebuchadnezzar meant, oh, he's like a divine being. But Daniel goes, oh, or is he like the divine being. And so one of, the, one of the classic interpretations of this is that the fourth man who appears with them 
is the pre-incarnate Jesus, who is indeed the Son of God. It might also be an angel. It's a little ambiguous. But I like to think of it as Jesus, who is there with them in their darkest moment, or their brightest moment. (laughs) And in the same way, a moment that was supposed to be of great persecution and great misery becomes their hour of glory, just like with Jesus. Um, It's also interesting that uh, Nebuchadnezzar calls Yahweh the Most High God. He says, servants of the Most High God. And this is a very common word in the uh, Old Testament that foreigners, pagans, give in reference to Israel's God after they realize who this guy is. See, before, they're like, oh, you know, he, he's the God of Israel. After they see who he is, then they're like, oh, he is the most high God. This is the God above all other gods, the one who holds all authority on heaven and earth. Twenty. Uh, let, let's finish it out now. <laughs> 28 through 30. This is, this is the fun part, I think. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the province of Babylon. Perfect. I I love that. Uh, Anyone who doesn't worship God, this is a thrilling conclusion. Anyone who doesn't worship Yahweh, anyone who speaks bad about him, will be torn limb from limb, and their house laid in ruins. Which is not the first time we've heard this curse come out of Nebuchadnezzar's mouth, actually. Do you remember the first time that it shows up? If they couldn't interpret the dream, yes. Go to chapter 2, verse 5. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. Which means that the like 15 times that Nebuchadnezzar gets a speaking part, like two of the times, this is what he says. This must have just been like one of his favorite expressions, you know? Like, uh, I, I, uh, you know, we all have these expressions that we say. Um, And I guess Nebuchadnezzar's was, oh, torn limb from limb and his house laid in ruins. But so aside from this being kind of a fun, you know, habit that Nebuchadnezzar had. I think it also points to the connection between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Chapter 2 begins with this curse. Chapter 3 ends with this curse. So chapter 2 and chapter 3 then are sort of bookended by these curses, and so I think they're meant to be read together in a way. The first one is about Daniel and how he points to how God is the one who's really in charge. Chapter 3 is about the three men who are pointing to how God is really the one who is in charge. And there's a connection here in theme. Okay, now we've talked through it. Oh yeah, we got plenty of time. We've we've talked through this now. We've read through the whole story. What I want you to do is I'm gonna give you all a piece of paper and does everyone at your table, does someone at each of your tables have a pen? I've got some of them. Uh, Okay, I'm going to go around and give each table a piece of paper. And what I want you to write on the piece of paper is two things. I want you to write a summary of the book of Daniel, chapter 3. So a summary of the story, the narrative we've just talked through. And then second, I want you to write what this has to do with us today. How can, where can we put ourselves in this story? But what do we learn from this? So pass around a paper, summary of the book, what does it have to do with us today? Every, make sense? Okay, I'm going to give you all some time to write that down on your pieces of paper. And you all have to agree as a table. So 
well, whatever works best for you. You know, democracy, uh, you can take it out of the parking lot, it's just over there, whatever works. <laughs> Do you want me to write it? Yeah. Max. Okay. Say. Summary. Summary. Right there. Old Matt said, worship the state. The boys said, no thanks. Right. Matt said, no thanks. God said, no thanks. Okay. Enjoyed the most of the millennial. Summary. Summary. <laughs> if you don't have a pen, just raise your hand, I'll bring you one. I don't know. 
Oh, what time? Oh, 10.30. 10.30. Okay. Okay. Perfect, perfect. What time is 10.45? Yes. Yeah. I feel like you should know this. <laughs> you think that I've been here how many years? I think it took a year. Well, it's I just okay. feel like you're kind of important in this situation. I know, right? I'm used to another schedule. On, on Vicarage, like my last week, someone comes into the office and they're like, oh, you know, I'm thinking about joining the church what, or, or coming to the service. What what time is the um, Sunday worship? And I stare at him and go, <laughs> I have no idea. I usually get there at 8 a.m. I've been here for a year, and I don't know what time worship starts. I just show up. I just show up, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm here like an hour before. Get here at 8, you'll, you'll be there on time, I promise. That's so funny. All right, so y'all all have at least a summary. So what I'm going to do, because we don't have lots of time, I want, I'm going to point at a table and have you explain the first thing and then go to the next table and then have you explain the next thing until we finish the story. Make sense? Okay, so, so we'll start with these guys. All What's right. the first thing that happens? Neb said, worship the thing. Perfect. <laughs> table two. <laughs> the three amigos refuse and they are sent to the furnace. Perfect. Those who threw them in get burned and not them. Perfect. Back one. Okay. So you went when you in big picture with and who's who's showing that in this story? <laughs> well, that is a good point. Maybe God is the main character. That's not a bad way, bad way to read all scripture, actually. Maybe God's the one that this is actually about, huh? Okay, so what happens after uh, they get thrown in and the people who were throwing them in get burned up? Yeah. He is in new decree. Two. Well, what's the new decree? That Nebuchadnezzar issues at the end of the story. Absolutely. And I, that's the end of the story, guys. I, God revealed himself to Nebuchadnezzar as the true God. As a true God. Yes. Okay. So, in terms of the. Okay, the blue marker I decided didn't work very well. So, I, I liked all summaries. Um, and I don't. Hmm. With the application, then, instead of asking for each of y'all's application, I want to ask a question. Who, in their application, in, in the application, you sort of, one of the ways that we apply is by putting ourselves, ourselves in the shoes of someone in the story. We say, well, I want to be like this person. I want to learn from this person. Show of hands, who reads the story and goes, well, I, I, I'm just like these three men, or I should be just like these three men. Should be, should be, yeah. Everybody pretty much read it from the three men's perspective, right? Anybody read it from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective? He's ridiculous, absolutely. Okay, so shift in focus now. What I want to do now is read the story again from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. Now, this is, I, I think this is a really helpful way to read a Bible passage. When, when, when you read a passage, especially one maybe you read several times before, and, and you want to get something new out of it, try reading it from a different character's <laughs> perspective, especially maybe the bad guy's perspective, because you might learn something. So I, I, what I want to do is I want to go through this story now and do what we did before where I point at a table and you kind of summarize an event. But I want to do it from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. And I actually want to start in chapter 2, verse 47. So I'll start with that. Well, we'll go in the opposite order now. This very middle table here. What happens in chapter 2, verse 47?
Nebuchadnezzar believes in the true God. That's what David. Absolutely. Nebuchadnezzar believes in God. And I'm not going to write Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to spell that. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. That's supposed to be an epic problem. Nebuchadnezzar believes in God. Perfect. Okay, so then what happens at the beginning of chapter 3? <laughs> he builds a golden image. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar forgets <laughs> builds a statue. Okay, what happens after that? Uh, he found out from a certain Chaldean that the uh, Eric and Bingo were not doing what he told them. Okay, next table. So we heard some that some weren't worshiping the statue. What next? Back table. Orders and punish. Do, does it say why? Yes. How how's Nebuchadnezzar feel about that? So he's angry. Angry, yes. We put angry in all caps. Angry punishes them. Okay, and then what happens when he tries to punish them? Nothing happens to them. Nothing happens to them. Okay, so, all right, uh, God intervenes. How about that? So God intervenes then. And then what happens to Nebuchadnezzar when he sees that? When he sees that, then he says that he really is the true God. So he comes around to a God of faith. He comes around to it. So, all right, again, Nebuchadnezzar believes in God. So, if we read the story, yeah. So, I'm trying to think of, he's not saying, no, that that's not the God. He just thinks that it's the highest of the gods. The highest of the gods, yeah. But he's not going to all know. This is true. But he also recognizes that maybe worshiping these other gods isn't the best idea. Because these guys won't. And these guys clearly have some something going for them, right? How faithful Nebuchadnezzar ever is to Yahweh is a matter of debate. And, and you'll, you, know, you, you can go several ways on it. I think in the narrative, though, the point that Daniel is making is clear. Whether or not there's some nuance here, in uh, 2.28 or 2.58, at the end of chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar believes in God, at least in some sense of the word. And in the end, Nebuchadnezzar believes in God. And the rest of the story after, at the start of chapter 3, really, is about God bringing Nebuchadnezzar back to faith in him. I want to look at point 2 here. Why does Nebuchadnezzar build the statue? A any guesses? Yeah. I think it was important for him to see something. Okay. Keep going. You know, they had to have a visual there. Uh, even though he might believe something else, he had to have a visual for his people. Something for them to believe in. That was the, the whole basis, the whole background was okay. worshiping images. So, uh, how about, uh, so here, here I'll put rationale. I'm sure you can't read my handwriting at all. The rationale. The first reason is it made sense, right? Maybe Nebuchadnezzar defects from God because, well, you know, God, you're just being unrealistic here. This makes sense. And so Nebuchadnezzar is unfaithful because, well, you know, sometimes perfect faith in God, it just doesn't quite make sense. God's making unreasonable demands. No images? Really? Come on. 
could it have been a misunderstanding of who Yahweh was? Like, did he think that Yahweh needed to have three steps? I don't think so. And, and here's, here's my argument. And so she asks, is it possible that Nebuchadnezzar was making the statue of Yahweh? And I would say probably not. And, and my grounding for that is chapter 3. It's a good question. Because sometimes, sometimes when we see an idol made, it is of Yahweh. Think, think of uh, Israel's golden calf. Aaron says of the golden calf, here is the God that brought you out of Egypt. He says this golden calf is a symbol of Yahweh. So that does happen. But... Um, in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar says to the three men, is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I set up? And so I think Nebuch the statue is in some way representative of Nebuchadnezzar's gods. But good question. Yeah? It's interesting where he's referred to as king mm -hmm. very often in chapter 3. But he's going to meet the true king of kings. This is true. And then I wonder, too, if the officials, they're not so afraid of the statue, but they're afraid of is the fiery returns. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. So, in one way, then, we could say that building the statue is an assertion of his kingship. If we, especially if we think the statue is of him, then building the statue could be a way to say, hey, look, I'm the one in charge. And so, building the statue could be a sign of maybe pride or a desire for power. Good. Pride, power, yeah. And if it's made of gold, it's a sign of wealth. Mm, okay, so, so boasting, pride. Absolutely. The only thing that burns in the furnace is what they were bound in. So, the one thing is that, you know, sometimes in our suffering, our suffering may cause us to uh, burn away those things that hinder us. That's true. And the other thing, too, in the sermon today, or the stewardship being shot, the fiery furnace is not shining. Okay. Don't spoil the sermon. I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> okay. We got... Oh, okay. I'm just going to give you the last one that I was thinking of. Um, so the last reason that I think he might have made the statue here. Oh. Think about it this way. Nebuchadnezzar is coming from a world that believes in these gods. He's coming from a world that believes in these gods that he's building a statue of have power. And he is afraid. We don't really know why. Maybe things aren't, are starting to not go very well in his kingdom. Maybe he's forgotten the promise that Daniel made in chapter 2 that things were going to go well in his kingdom. So maybe Nebuchadnezzar is afraid of what is happening. And so he is desperately grabbing for any semblance of control that he can get. And so he turns to these gods, these pagan gods, who offer him power. These pagan gods who he knows how they work. You build a statue of them and they do it you want them to do. This is the world that he's living in. And so I think he, it's also possible that he built this statue out of fear. He built the statue because he's afraid. And this would be then why he's so mad at these guys for not worshiping. Guys, you're endangering the nation. Our hope is in this statue. Our hope is in these gods. And if they're mad at us because of you, we're all going to be in trouble for it. Now here's my concluding question that I want you to stew on for the rest of the week. How many times do we build some sort of idol? Do what God doesn't want us to do because, well, God, you're just being unrealistic. Or maybe out of pride. Or maybe out of a desire for power. Or, or maybe out of a fear of lacking trust in God. How many times do all these things lead us to our own golden statutes, our own idolatry, our own wandering away from God, what God wants us to do? When we are in those situations, remember the story, how Nebuchadnezzar strays from God, and God does miraculous signs to bring him back to faith in him. He doesn't just say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you messed up, and he wipes him off the face of the earth. He has mercy. And he brings Nebuchadnezzar back to him, just as God brings us back to him when we stray. All right. There's so much more to talk about, guys. So continue, continue to read. If you have any questions, I'll be around.
except right after this, I have to get up to service. Um, but I want to want to close in a word of prayer. We pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing Nebuchadnezzar back to faith in you. In the same way, O oh Lord, when we stray because of our pride, because of our fear, because of our lack of trust in your ways, bring us back to you by your word and sacrament. Bring us back time and time again by your miracles, by your people, that we may again trust in the promises that you have made, that we may not stray again, but may be faithful to you. Lord, in all the ways that we stray, you call back to us. You left the 99 sheep to find the one lost one. Lord, in all the times that we stray, bring us back to you and help us to be faithful to you, that we may be faithful until that day when we will stray no more, when our faith will become sight, and we will see you in glory, more glory than the three men in the furnace, more glory than Nebuchadnezzar's statue, more glory than all these things. We will see you in your glory and will trust in you and see you. Help us to be faithful until that day and bring us always back to you until that day when our faith becomes sight. In your name we pray, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Here's the schedule for next time. <laughs> Chapter 5, next week, the Vince. You don't want to miss it. That's some good stuff. Thank you. Mm, it's a special presentation. Cool. Is that a I'm excited for it. David. You haven't missed anything. You haven't missed anything. Uh -huh. He's going to talk about. Just uh, make sure you don't want to I think so. Are you literature? Yes.